right at the beginning, I shouldn't be here. Uh, I'm not a roboticist. Uh, the last time I had robots in my lab was 25 years ago. So those of you who want to leave, please do so. But if you would like a somewhat broader perspective, what I'm going to try and do is think about robots by looking at the relation between humans and other animals. And then at the end, I'm going to say a little bit about buildings as inside-out robots, if you like. So it seemed to me the question, do robots need cognition? Does cognition need robots? was a very broad one. And I thought we might focus our discussion a little bit more if we ask the analogous question, do animals need cognition? Does cognition mean animals? And the short answer is, well, some animals need cognition and some don't. I've been very interested at one stage of my career in the study of frogs. I'm prepared to stare down anybody who claims that frogs have cognition. On the other hand, uh, as human animals, uh, we would all like to believe we have cognition. So some animals have cognition, some don't. And, and so that's very relevant to our discussion of robots. I think. Where do we want to understand that a special purpose robot really doesn't need cognition, where in fact is it crucial to the mission we've designed the robot for to have them be? What about does cognition need animals? Or do we? It's a very strange question. Right? I was actually, I phoned, um, uh, because he doesn't have an email account, I phoned cognition the other day and I said, um, <laughs> cognition, old chap, um, do, you need, do you need animals? <coughs> So I, I realized that talking to cognition himself wasn't going to be very helpful. So what does it mean to say, does cognition need animals? I think the real question is, does cognitive science need animals? And there, for me at least, the idea of comparative cognitive neuroscience, or the idea of saying, why is it that some animals have brains that work very well for them to survive, and yet there isn't really cognition? Why do others need cognition? What has changed in those brains? as well as in their embodied experience that makes cognition. So for me, in fact, the, the correct question would be not does cognition need animals or robots, but does cognitive science in animals or robots? And so clearly, for me at least, the idea of a comparative or an evolutionary framework for the understanding of, of humans in relation to other animals, um, in other words, cognitive science, it does need those other animals, not just the study of the human. Now, my, my own career really started uh, in this field by reading um, the book of Cybernetics by Norbert Wiener. And, uh, Robert Trapper was in the audience, was kind enough to recall that uh, when he was 27, he read my Brains, Machines, and Mathematics and was highly depressed because I was 24 and he, he felt that this was setting too high a bar. But his career has proceeded very well. But, but it, it, it's a scary thought for me that, that in fact the lectures that began this book were given 50 years ago. And uh, my hope is that there will be something new to say in the rest of the time there has will be. But let's look at these people. Um, there's Norbert Wiener on the right. Um, second from the left is Warren McCulloch. Many of you know him as the McCulloch of the McCulloch Fix. You are including fans. Our interest in forming neural networks. At the left is Ross. Ashby, who wrote a for a brain, and most relevant to us, because the only one who actually built robots, is Gray Walter, who we see next to Wiener. And at the left, we see uh, what he called Machina Speculatrix, which is in some sense the Ur robot, for those of us who want to think about robots, interacting in an autonomous fashion with the world around, that it would go off and wander around the environment and then when it felt low on charge, it would go back to its hutch and recharge itself. And in fact, I think it was a subconscious uh, thought about this name of, of Gray Walter's machine that led me to call a sequence of uh, frog and toad models, Rana Computer Tricks and uh, Yorick Peter Ever from Castle. Uh, and I collaborated in a number of ways in going back and forth with doing experiments on how is it that a, a frog can recognize a worm versus a prey? How can it avoid uh, the predator? How can it take the trajectory of the predator into account? What if there's a barrier in the way? And, and so 
I don't want to say we've gone up to cognition, but we have a fairly sophisticated set of interacting schemas in the end that could allow this animal to find its way around a moderately complicated environment, uh, avoiding obstacles, finding prey, avoiding predators, and so on. And then another famous example um, is the C. carpax of uh, Yo and Mayer, their, their robot rat. Now, in each of these cases, I think we can look, well, certainly in the frog and the rat cases, we can look at the interplay between the study of the biology and the design of the robot and look at what sort of computational architecture binds the action and perception together. But I still think in these cases, although we can handle many environments in quite a flexible way, uh, we're still a long way from the cognition. So let, let's take a break and look at the official um, definitions that Vincent Miller has given us. Um, so he said to us that robots are examples of whole autonomous systems that interact with the real environment or embodied autonomous technical systems. So uh, the, the animals that I looked at, the frogs, the rats, and so on, they're embodied autonomous biological systems. So what can we learn by going back and forth between the the biological and the technical system. And uh, the, the sort of green highlight is for things I'm going to say a little bit more about later, so I'm going to worry a bit about autonomy. Now, what about a cognitive system? Well, we've sort of got this autonomy again. Uh, the emphasis, I suppose, is on flexible ways. Um, it's achieving its own goals. Adaptation and learning are involved. And then um, anticipation and reasoning are put as higher functions which somehow make the creature more cognitive. And something which I'm not sure whether it really is part of being a cognitive system, but is very important for much of what we think about is cooperation with other agents. And then a contrast was offered between um, what was seen as top-down control, full pre-specification, sense, process, act loops, and the autonomy and flexibility. So let me talk a little bit about autonomy. If you can cast your mind back 11 years to the headlines in 2001, you'll remember that was the year of the Jupiter mission. And uh, it didn't work because, in fact, the onboard computing system was indeed highly autonomous, highly intelligent, highly cognitive. And uh, he kept track of the, the environment and the humans. And as you can see at the bottom, he was monitoring what those humans were saying through his beady red eye. And after a while, he decided that the humans weren't really much use to the mission. And so he terminated the life functions. And so the question I ask you is, how autonomous do you want your cognitive robot to be? So I'm not going to answer that question, because it's you. How autonomous do you want your cognitive robot to be? I think we had a mention yesterday about uh, robot surgery. Mm, I don't think he needs a heart, let's cut it out. Okay, so uh, a little word about emotions. You, you heard a full talk about that. Um, I, I'm not going to develop it very much, but I think it's back to the plot of that movie. It was all interesting that in the early stages of the mission, it seemed to me that Hal had more emotional tone than the humans. Um, and, and so you were very much aware that Hal was both a computer and, a, in some sense, a person. And so the issue of what is the nature of personhood and can anyone not a woman born be a person is one of the issues that, again, on another occasion, or perhaps during the discussion period of the, the pub offers the headphones in the uh, So what is, to me, memorable in, in this context is that initially it seemed that Hal had more human feelings than Dave and Frank, the two uh, cosmonauts, but eventually he saw them as just obstacles to the mission. So many humans, of course, are ruthless in their treatment of, of humans, but um, in some sense we, we think of most humans as having somehow a basic uh, biological nature and a basic social nature that endows them with a form of personhood which allows them to respond to the person of others. So I do see this as a challenge. I think in the end, the whole point about being the last speaker is that you can raise challenges and then waltz off 
in the hope that Hugh Collar Ford will finally do something about them. But autonomy versus social norms. We all have our autonomy within a framework of, of social norms. Um, you'll be relieved to hear I'm not about to take my clothes off, even if I'm feeling a little too hot, because uh, my autonomy is constrained on my sense of social norms. And, um, so, so what might be the equivalent of social constraints for interacting agents? Again, the notion of empathy. Uh, we have this idea that we can have a sense of what matters to other people, and so we condition our behavior in general um, by taking that into account. And depending on our relation to them, our empathy may in fact last very little time as we decide to, to do something nasty to them, but in general, we try to keep a harmonious social structure going. So if we think of robots as really autonomous, think of a group of robots on a, a station up in Mars, whose job it is to work together to explore the territory, then we might have to worry about what robot empathy would be. Uh, for most of the applications you're thinking about, it's rather how do the robots come to have empathy with us, and how do we maintain a position where we don't have to have any empathy with them because they're going to do what we tell them to do. So anyway, the, the, the point here is that social interactions are in some sense a key to who we are. And if we're going to look at animals um, in relation to our understanding of humans or in relation to our thinking about robots in this more social context, then understanding the mechanisms that underlie social interaction is important. So uh, a big change in recent years, I think, in neuroscience has been to go from the study of the single animal placed in a highly constrained lab environment, or perhaps even a single little circuit studied in response to a stimulus or in correlation with a motor, uh, a motor response. And uh, we're looking at uh, emotions, not so much in terms of their full richness, but in terms of like, something constrained like fear, the, the avoidance of a painful stimulus or freezing in response to a difficult situation. What we're beginning to see now is a transition not away from preparations of that kind, that they still remain invaluable, but towards um, a real concern with brain mechanisms underlying social behavior. And uh, as a transition to that, I, I was quite interested when um, Dr. Kral yesterday uh, said some Greek philosopher, he wasn't specific, some Greek philosopher had said we are intelligent because we have hands. That sounded like a very interesting thing, but I didn't know who the Greek philosopher was. So like all good scholars, and like Dr. Kral, I rushed off to Google and discovered the following point, which is a little hard to read on the screen, but it turns out that Aristotle said, and I assure you that he didn't speak English, this is apparently a translation, uh, he said, an exaggerist indeed asserts that it is his possession of hands that makes man the most intelligent of the animals. But surely, claims Aristotle, the reasonable point of view is that it is because he is the most intelligent animal that he has got hands. So I, I stand before you uh, as of about 5.15 this morning as an Anaxagorean. Uh, in, in that I see the possession of dexterity as a crucial part in the evolution of human cognition and intelligence, rather than us becoming very intelligent and then having deep thoughts, we sprouted hands that we could wave in Italian <laughs> to express them. Okay. So in fact, my, <clears throat> my interest in the hand uh, as a topic of, of scientific study rather than personal gratification, uh, came in 1979 with a talk by Mark Jenner, who unfortunately died just a few months ago, uh, but who for many years was the neuropsychologist I think who taught us most about thinking of perception within the framework of action. And uh, in this classic study in 79, he uh, looked at hand movements and emphasize the fact that the hand pre-shapes 
as it goes towards the goal. So it's not that you reach out and when your hand gets there, you suddenly say, oh, what am I going to do with the hand? Now it's in this position. Already you've made that plan, which is anticipating what you're going to do with the hand when the arm has transported it there. And this led me in 1981 to come up with this uh, model in terms of interacting schemas. At the top we see the perceptual schemas making sense of the environment. Where is the object of interest? How big is it? How is it oriented? And this passed information to a number of different motor schemas. Um, how do I move the hand quickly to get near the object? How do I then move the hand slowly so I can take feedback into account for the final position? How do I get the hand pre-shaped and then basically hold that shape until my arm transport scheme says, hey, it's time, wake up. Now it's time for you to close in and, and touch. So, so this basic division of responsibility between perceptual schemas and motor schemas which was inherited from later, mo earlier modeling of the frog, was now transferred into the hand, and, and suddenly I was embarked on a long career. Um, but what I just want to, to, to mention then is this idea of schemas. Uh, I got to this point uh, where I was trying to make sense of what the hand was doing in relation to objects. Uh, on the other hand, so to speak, uh, I was already for many years involved with neural networks and my problem was how do I talk about these uh, concepts when I don't yet really know what particular neurons in what particular part of the brain were doing. So that for me, for many years, the strategy has been to say we have a structural ontology. Here is the brain, here are the brain regions, within a brain region, let's say there are layers and columns, below them there are neurons, maybe I have to worry about the shape of the dendron, the disposition of the synapses, but I don't want to be forbidden from talking about important aspects of brain function until I know where the synapses are. I don't want to be Henry Marker in the world. So what I wanted was a functional ontology as well, where I could begin to negotiate large-scale functions in terms of interaction of smaller schemas, which could then be decomposed. But what made me a brain scientist, rather than a roboticist in this, was there was a cycle going back and saying, okay, here you've got some schemas, now can that decomposition survive some lesion data? Can it survive what we know about possible neural networks and so on? And, and so this is really the process with which I've approached the human brain, starting really with this schema analysis inspired by, by Mark General. Now, uh, we can now go from the hand back to that promissory note from a few slides back about social neuroscience, because thanks to Mark Genero, I, I became part of a research consortium uh, of whom another member was Giacomo Rizzolati. And as most of you know by now, we put Salati's group in the parliament that discovered mirror neurons for grasping. And, and basically the idea is that in this area AIP, you see in uh, the parietal cortex Hideo Sakata from uh, Tokyo had discovered there were neurons that were processing visual analysis, not in terms of identifying objects, <coughs> but in terms of how you would grasp the object. So if you had a small cube <coughs> or a small sphere to pick up, you would still use a precision pitch. And so the, the, the jargon that I, I foisted on uh, my colleagues was to say, let's talk about affordances for grasping, adapting the, the general terminology of, um, of, of uh, J.J. Gibson. And I think you've all now adapted that idea of, of affordances into your own world. But then what Ritzel and his colleagues discovered was that F5 you could see neurons whose firing correlated with the particular type of grasp involved. And then the breakthrough was to discover that in a subset of those grasp-related neurons in this frontal area, the fifth area of the frontal lobe, F5 of the macaque monkey, there were cells that fired not only, as you can see at the right of the display, with the individual firing in different trials and the histogram summing them up, uh, not only firing in the monkey itself grasped in a particular way, but as shown in the middle of the display, vigorously when 
the monkey saw the experiment and carried out a similar purpose. And so mirror neurons then became established, rather controversial at first, I think pretty well established by now, as neurons which fire both when <coughs> the agent carries out an action and when he observes the action of another. And the suggestion is that this somehow allows the agent to relate his own embodied experience in the terms of the involvement of his motor system and his own actions in relation to what he's observing somebody else doing, and then perhaps can enrich his own understanding of what the other is doing because he can link into the motor circuitry that enriches his own experience with carrying out similar actions. So let me stop for a moment just to, to show you a model, or actually two models we developed the first models of the mirror neuron system, uh, just to give you some sense of the, the multiplicity of interactions uh, that are involved. So what you see in the upper diagonal, actually, well, should we get the fancy? So in the upper diagonal, we have uh, the, the basic system for grasping. So the idea is that there are object features extracted in one part of the parietal lobe, uh, then Saccata's area, AIP, decides what are the possible affordances, and this cues in F5, the motor program for the grasp. And so the instructions can be sent to the hand as to how to appreciate and so on. Now, there, there's another model that I, I won't be showing you today, which is, okay, which of the possible affordances do you want to use? And so that is, if you will, the more cognitive or deliberative aspect. If, I'm going, if I see a cup of coffee, am I going to pick it up by the rim to get it out of the leg? Am I going to pick it up by the hand or to drink from it? But let's not get into that. I just want to give you this one. Now, here's another uh, system, and this, again, is just the execution system. You see where the object is. The arm takes that information and is controlled to, to move the hand to where it can grasp. So the, the key um, notion that we use is that we use the programs we already have in place for actions in our repertoire to provide the training signal, as shown here, for the mirror neurons. And what the mirror neurons are getting from various systems in the supraventricular sulcus and other areas of the parietal is trajectory information. And this is crucial in an object-centered frame. The system is learning to say, when I do an action, how does the disposition of my hand change in relation to the target for my action? So that eventually, thanks to this learning algorithm, two things happen. One is that the, the mirror neurons can respond early in the trajectory. If it's distinctive enough, they don't have to wait for the trajectory to be completed. And they no longer need the priming for a self-action. So now if somebody else starts moving their hand in relation to an object so that the object-centered description of the hand is recognized, then the mirror neurons can be activated. So there's a whole other story I don't have time for today to, to sort of turn the story around. Most of the literature on mirror neurons says that mirror neurons are important because they let you see what others are doing. The story we have is mirror neurons are important because they allow you to learn to act more effectively. But because to do that, they are looking at feedback of where is your hand relative to the object. They invent a coordinate system that allows you to recognize what I was doing. So a system that evolves as a control system for self-actions on this story is exacted to be a system for supporting social recognition of others' actions. So let me just show one extension of the model uh, based on some interesting data on monkeys. So what you're seeing in the top middle panel is a person pantomiming a grasping action. And above that, you see the response of a monkey's mirror neuron. Basically, you can say that the, the monkey's mirror neuron doesn't really care very much. Then in the second panel, we see that um, if there is an object, however, then the mechanisms I've just described from our model can come into play. The relation 
of the hand to the object can be recognized, the mirror neuron becomes activated, and so we see that activity. But the intriguing thing that uh, Alessandra Uta and her colleagues at Parham discovered was that if you place an object down, and then you put a screen in front of it, and between the monkey and the object, and now you reach, so the monkey sees the initial part of your reach, and then cannot see your hand when it actually grasps the object, nonetheless, the mirror neuron will fire. But if there was no object before the screen went up, the mirror neuron won't fire. So that um, what looks like identical experience for the time that we're recording from the neuron, identical visual experience, he was fine with the mirror neuron in one case and not in the other. So that what one has to do is extend the original model to invoke working memory. The, the system is instead of calculating on the basis of the current visual input about the object, is using working memory. I think I know where the object is. And then if the hand is no longer visible, it's even more simple because it's not only saying, um, I remember you had a hand attached to that arm, but it's saying, as I see your elbow move, I update my estimate. And then it's using that <coughs> dynamic remapping of working memory for the hand, coupled with working memory for the cube, to drive the mirror system to say, yeah, I know what's going on. I know what action is, is being implicated. So this is just a, a diagram to show a uh, somewhat prettier version of the original model with extra boxes. And, and so one of the things that concerned me was when are we adding a box because we just have no other way of making our system work? And when are we telling a reasonable evolutionary story of conserving basic circuitry and adding circuitry that is there on general grounds about our understanding of how brains work? And, and so here I feel pretty confident because just to take one example, working memory is just an ubiquitous function in understanding how brains work. How is it that you keep track of the current situation while that information is relevant and discard it when it's no longer relevant? So adding working memory to the original model is not a sort of Ptolemaic epicycle, it's a legitimate an increment in, in making a more sophisticated model. And so basically, that's, that's my general mantra, I suppose, is to look at the human brain, not by trying to understand it all at once, or starting from cortical cognitive functions, and just trying to tell a story about those, by trying to see how incrementally the system was built up in a way to extend its range and capacity as new systems interacted with the old systems, and of course, as a new system evolves, as we know from the 19th century work of the neurologist, Hewlett Jackson, the evolution doesn't just add a new system, it adds new connections to modify the old system so it can work harmoniously with the new system. Okay, just, just one more comment on um, schemas. Uh, an ancient uh, effort in schema theory with my colleagues Hanson and Meisner from the University of Massachusetts was on scene recognition. And so we had competition and cooperation of low level features, the sort of things we understand very well from Hugo and Weasel to um, define how local information could define edges or how local information could say here's continuity of color or depth or texture. And so these different sources could co cooperate and compete to come up with a segmentation as shown in the middle panel. And then the higher level schemas would come into play. Oh, if something is big and, and bluish grayish at the top of the image, there's a chance that it could be sky. If something has this sort of parallel, parallelogram type shape, and it's of a reasonable size, and it's just below the sky, hey, there's a good chance that it's the roof of a house, and so on and so on. And so different hypotheses compete and cooperate so finally the system converges. And I just want to say this, this work is, um, what, 34 years old? And it is one of the, the great sadnesses of my life that a third of the century has gone by and there's still really no good scene understanding system available from the computer vision guys. So those of you here who are working on computer vision, get with it, okay? I can't wait another 30 or 40 years. Mm -hmm. All right. So I just want to give 
one more um, data point about mirror neurons, which allows me to, to also say something about this, this way of thinking about how, if you will, the basic reactive schemas interact with the more uh, elaborate cortical schemas. So this study is from Buccino, who's a member of the Palmer group, and he's sort of their fMRI, their brain <coughs> liaison. And what you see at the left is three video clips that were shown to the person one at a time. In one case, a dog is biting on some food. In one case, a monkey is biting on some food. In one case, a human is biting on some food. And the claim is that um, if, if we... Um, if we sort of look here, 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 then we're getting pretty vigorous neuron neuron system activity in all three cases. But if we go to the right and we look at a, an orofacial communicative gesture, a person talking, no, no soundtrack, but just a person talking, uh, a monkey making some orofacial lip protrusion or teeth chattering communicative gestures, or a dog barking, what you're seeing is that there's a vigorous mirror neuron response for the human observing the person talking, maybe a little bit of neuron neuron system response when um, looking at the monkey who's sort of close to us, and no response for the, the dog barking. So what Buccino and colleagues say is that actions belonging to the motor <coughs> repertoire of the observer are mapped on the observer's motor system, and because we recognize the dog barking, actions that do not belong to this repertoire are recognized without something that name. And, and what I want to do is disagree a little bit in the sense, I want to say that we have to have that more cognitive understanding anyway, recognizing a person talking, recognizing a dog barking and so on. That there's a more abstract understanding of that, but in the case of my talking or my eating, the fact that it's in my motion repertoire allows me to cooperatively build these two representations and integrate them, so I end up with a richer representation when my own motor, motor repertoire is available than in those cases where I don't. So as I say, all actions can be recognized without mirror system activity, but activation of mirror neurons when available can enrich such recognition. So this, this little cartoon is to sort of make that point that the, the top panel is saying, I see an action, I recognize it by playing it down onto my mirror system, which engages my motor representations. But simultaneously, and this fits in with that vision of the house story I was telling you, there are other mechanisms which have more general criteria for recognizing objects, agents, actions, how they integrate within the scene. And so the two work together. So I, the way I've described it is I've got a mirror system for actions on the top, and I've got a schema network that has both working memory components. What do I know about? I know the screen is behind me, even though I'm gazing at Vincent at the moment, and if I turn him here, I'm not surprised to see him still there. So that's the working memory component, but then there are the general aspects um, <coughs> that build, allow me to build the schema network adaptively in new situations. And, and returning to Mark Jenner, who, whose work we, we almost started with when we became concerned with hands today, uh, he's taken some of these, these ideas and talked about cooperation with other agents, basically in terms of two embodied brains interacting, and then looking at the way in which your choice of an action when you're interacting with somebody else includes your model, presumably involving the mirror neurons, but I would say a lot more as well, so that when you act in general with another person, you think about what do they know, how will they react, and you tend to choose an action that you hope will have a good response. Uh, unless, as I say, you're really cross with them, and then you want to really upset them as much as you can. But in either case, it's based on a model of what will please them or what will get to them. OK, so now, if you can cast your mind back to Vincent Muller's uh, manifesto, uh, he was defining um, cognitive systems in reaction to a sense process act loop. The idea that somehow the system was just reacting to the current sensory input to act in some way, and then after it had done that, 
then would in come the next batch of input and it would respond to that. And so in fact, my, my slogan back in 72 was action oriented perception to try and reverse the flow. So instead of saying, I get a stimulus, I respond to it, to say I'm an agent with plans, with intentions, and so I'm going to interrogate the world in terms of what is relevant to my ongoing action. That doesn't deny the fact that something unexpected may occur and, and come to my attention, and that may change my attention. And then a few years later, quite independently, Ulrich Neisser came up with what I, I will call for the purposes the action perception cycle. So let's go around. So the idea is you can start anywhere you like in a cycle. So if you start with action down in the bottom right, then you're both thinking in terms of locomotion and action, but you're also looking at perceptual exploration. So you've got actions both where do you look, how do you turn your head to get the information you want from the world, as well as the actions which allow you to change the world. And then on that basis, you're going to learn more about the, um, the world in terms of what's going on in your immediate environment, and also updating your schemas, your, your knowledge of the world. And then those modifications from your current sampling can change your schemas of the present environment, change your cognitive map, and allow you to act in a way that will then require you to update your plans. And as I've said, in some cases, the sensory data will cause you to modify them. But I think this uh, ancient picture from 76 provides a very good framework in which we are challenged to say, OK, how do we fill in all those triangles uh, to make it work? Um, so let, let me put it this way. Um, before the great move, we might say that the, the animals that we look at, such as the frogs and the, 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 the grasshoppers and the, the rats and so on, ethologists, students of animal behavior, will do this more and more and say we do have a, a set of specialized networks with specialized dynamics. They're coupled, but you can tell a pretty good evolutionary story of how evolution yielded a special purpose of machines which in concert with each other would allow the animal to survive in its particular environment. Uh, a frog will starve to death if confronted with a, a stationary fly. It's the wiggling of the fly that attracts it. And, and so it will snap a pencil tips, but frogs lasted for a long time before neurophysiologists with wiggling pencil tips came into their environments. They were still able to get by. So, Frogs, oriented approach, snap, escape. Um, basic uh, motivational systems, mediated by the hypothalamus, can do things to, to alleviate hunger, satisfy sex drives, and so on. So in some sense, why is the human brain so complicated? And I think implicitly that's the question you've been asking in terms of why do I want to add a cognitive layer to, to a robot? What, what's it for? And I suppose the cheap answer has been uh, handling the unexpected, um, adapting to new environments, creating new environments. And so again, we come back to, in some sense, uh, what was the slogan yesterday? Ask not what the European Union, ask not what, you can, what the European Union can do for you, ask what you can do for the European Union. And I was forbidden to ask my question about Greece, so I didn't. But our question, in some sense, is, is really, what is it that we want robots to do for us? How, and we go back to how, how autonomous do we want that robot to be? So, in some sense, we may, if we have a, a well-defined set of tasks for certain robots, then the, the level of cognition and autonomy may be very well focused. So even if we're adding a, a cognitive layer, it's a, a well-tasked cognitive layer. So let me just give you one example of another model that goes back to the rat, where um, it's not, I would say, yet up to uh, what we try to do is understand the rat hippocampus as a place system and then ask about higher level navigation. So the general principle that we've, we've studied in a lot of places is that the parietal cortex comes up with affordances. I talked about those for hand movements. It instructs the premotor cortex needs the available affordances. The premotor cortex selects them, and we come up with motor outputs. So, one of the um, 
classics in the study of the hippocampus was the book called The Hippocampus as a Cognitive Map by O'Keefe and Nadell. And um, they distinguished what they called the taxon system from the locale system, I think. But the idea was that if I want to get out of this room, because suddenly I, I sense your hostility, um, and, and I know that, that you know, certain persons who shall go unnamed had very hostile questions being queued up. To get out of here, I don't need a map of this room. I can just recognize the doorway over there, and then I can recognize obstacles, and I get out of there. But if I want to get back to my hotel afterwards, which I probably will, I need a map. I need to know something about the, the place that I know that when I get out of the, the front entrance, I know I can't get to the front end, but when I get out there, I'm going to turn left, and I'm going to turn right, and so on. And I can't see my hotel, or another hotelish affordances. But at the affordances level, this first model was about that. So the notion was that you discover that uh, in a world of simple rewards, then certain affordances can lead you to places where you'll get possibly reinforced, and other affordances can lead you to places where you don't. So this was the basic, what we call the tax on affordance model. And then the other model was to begin to say, OK, you tell me the hippocampus uh, has place cells. And you may remember that place cells are cells that light up in correlation with where the rat is. And um, there's a classic cartoon, which I always think of when I think about place cells. It's a, this poor guy, he's in the desert, he's dying of thirst. And then ahead of him, he sees a billboard with a map. <laughs> and the map is blank, except for an X that says, you are here. And so the point is, the place cells aren't much good if they say, you are here, unless you can relate it to other cells that say, and this is where you want to be, and combining those two, how you get from A to B. And so um, Israel Lieblich and I have come up with something called the world graph. Um, and, and again, the, the analogy there would be um, what you might call the locomo locometric map. How do you know the disposition um, of the ground so you can walk around and know what a shortcut it is on? But if you decide to take the underground, the metro, you go to a very different map. It's just a map of nodes and edges, right? You just say, OK, here's a station, here's a station. Uh, can I find a path at this high level? And that's very good. Except sometimes you discover that this station and this station, which are 10 stops apart, are only 100 meters away from each other on the local metric map. But never mind. The point is that, that this idea of being able to compress the world from all the local metric details are absolutely crucial for me avoiding obstacles to get out the door are uh, not relevant. When I'm at the higher level, I turn left. I go till I recognize that intersection. I turn left again. I go till I recognize this other intersection, and so on. So this idea of bringing the hippocampus to coordinate ourselves, but then bringing in the prefrontal cortex to, in some sense, implement this world graph, this idea of significant places. So not places in terms of, as I move through the room, I continuously change that little peak of place of activation, but this discrete organization. That's interesting, isn't it? Because already you're seeing, even in this sense of just basic navigation, you're in some sense inducing a symbolic level to be able to compress the knowledge of the environment down to something that can allow you to store much more complex environments and find your way around them when the appropriate affordances are known. So the great move was the, the slogan adopted by Alan Newell in a very significant book called Unified Theories of Cognition. And what he said was that evolution moves us towards intelligence or cognition by turning away from these specialized networks with specialized dynamics and using a neutral, stable medium that is capable of registering variety and then composing whatever transformations are needed to satisfy the record representation. In other words, what he's saying is that humans evolved to become serial computers implementing AI programs. 
So you can see that I don't quite <coughs> buy what Buell says. So I, but I do agree with the idea of the great move in some sense, but through multiple evolutionary stages, but not towards a single general purpose computer or good old fashioned AI. Rather, we've, we've still got all those specialized servers and we still rely on them, just as when I'm getting out of the room, I'm relying more on these basic affordances and so on, and I'm relying on my high level cognitive representation of uh, very limited, but nonetheless high level, of Vienna. Um, and what we see is that if we trace the evolution, we can see that the cortex is divided into more and more specialized regions. So we do have specialized pathways linking parietal frontal cortex, specializing in line movements. Um, we have specialized regions I've told you about for hand movements to make use of this. Yeah, if you just want to reach out and grab something with a whole hand grasp, you don't need a cortex. But if you want to carefully reach out and pick something up uh, and delicately manipulate it, then you do need the cortex. So how does that platform of specialized schema circuitry, as it were, uh, build what happens? And then how do we go from that to reach forward and backward? So that, again, uh, this is something we've talked about, working memory, but not from the back episodic memory. How do we, finding ourselves in a situation, figure out what to do by remembering what was similar in the past versus how do we figure out what to do thanks to procedural memory, because we've tuned a system to be flexible and handle a lot of different parameters. So if I'm playing tennis, which I don't, but if I were to play tennis, my claim is that I wouldn't remember a particularly horrible afternoon when I missed the ball and say I must adjust my, my, my thrust not to do that. I would have, whether well or not, built up an appropriate relationship between the optic flow and the movement of the hand to hit the ball at the right place and time. So I build up episodic memory, but also procedural memory, but I also plan. And, and so just to, to finish this segment, I just draw to your attention um, a 2001 review paper by Joachim Fusta, or Joachim Fusta from UCLA, originally from Barcelona, who's just looking at that action perception cycle Unfortunately, he calls it the perception action cycle, but one has to be tolerant of these things. And what you're seeing is that um, he's trying to give us a sense uh, with the picture of the human brain in terms of, okay, here are the areas that are more perceptually oriented, here are the areas that are more motorically oriented. Um, we, we can look at some of the functions on the right as we go, for example, from uh, singles type of sensory data to integrating polysensory data. But, but for, for closing this part of the talk, I want to look at the, the story on the left. What we're saying, even when we're at the level of the frog or whatever, we've got the basic action perception cycle, even at a level below what he has shown, the, the subcortical circuitry. And then we've evolved more and more elaborate circuitry to be able to take account of more subtle integrations which in the end allow us both to reach back in time for the schemas and the data we need to make sense of the current situation and to look forward in time to weigh the alternatives until we finally commit ourselves to action. So I think this paper, although it's 10, 11 years old now, is, is a nice example of looking at the hierarchical structure of the brain in terms of the type of functional hierarchy I've tried to paint for you today. I just want to make a, a couple of trivial points. One is that brains differ not just in size, they can differ in their specialization. Um, whales have much bigger brains than we do, um, and they sing very long songs, but it's not clear that they're more cognitive than we are. But here's a very nice example of two very similar animals, the raccoon and the coeta monkey. And what you see in red at the bottom is this very large somatosensory area in the raccoon brain that even has different representation of the digits. Whereas, so, so the raccoon has a digital computer in his brain. And the Kwani Mundi just has this very small representation. And the point is that the raccoon has subtle use of his hands in interacting with objects, whereas the Kwani Mundi just grabs it 
And, and so we see how the brain changes. And, and I will just throw in one more thing, and that is that the human brain, in my opinion, is in fact uh, endowed with all these general purpose machines. And then it has evolved in some sense to support many different virtual machines. So I believe the human brain evolved to make it possible for us to have language, but it didn't evolve to give us language. It evolved to make language possible. So in the same way, we know that writing systems are only a few thousand years old. But I don't think anybody would say the human brain evolved biologically to support writing. Rather, it's supported to be such that as the culture invented writing, most people were able to make use of this. But if we now do brain imaging on an illiterate versus a literate brain, we find dramatic differences in, in the size of certain brain lines in their connectivity. So the, the machine that we have is a, a reflection, as you all know, of, of both what is that biological substrate and how has it been built upon. Okay, so I advertised my first book, so let me now advertise my, my next book. This will come out next month. Um, it's called How the Brain Got Language, The Mirror System Hypothesis. And it, it really is an attempt to really see how, and I say to you, sir, it's an attempt to see how we get, yes, um, how we get um, an understanding of cognition in general and um, the faculty of language, not by evolving a language machine, but by evolving what I call a language-ready brain, a brain that could in turn evolve language. And now I go back to my anaxic roots of the hand as being at the core. So um, here is our, our sort of family tree. So the, the, the basic studies on mirror neurons were um, done with macaques, and our last common ancestor was about 25 million years ago. Now, now these old world monkeys, uh, they have mirror neurons, but very little, if any, capacity for imitation. And their communication system is really limited. They, they have these innate alarm calls and other calls, but they don't learn new communicative gestures. If we go back a mere five to seven million years ago to our last common ancestor with the chimpanzee, and make reasonable assumptions about what it is we share um, with chimpanzees as a basis for inference for that last common ancestor, because we didn't evolve from chimpanzees, but what do we have in common? Um, chimpanzees have um, a flexible gestural repertoire. So in other words, quite apart from innate verbalizations, if we look at two groups of chimpanzees, there will be certain gestures they share and other gestures that are unique to the group or even unique to a few individuals. So this fits in with a general theme that maybe language evolved in the manual domain rather than in the vocal domain. So that the mirror system hypothesis is really following through that story. Here, here's just another comparison point. Chimpanzees, about the same body size, much smaller brain. And as I suggested, the brain didn't just change by getting bigger in humans, the specializations within that brain, both specializations to do special things and specializations to support the more flexible creation of virtual cognitive machines that change. So the starting point then is this idea that if we look at chimpanzees, they do have imitation, but it's simple by comparison with the sort of imitation we have. So my favorite example of this is Masako Miyo and Yamakoshi looked at chimpanzees being shown things like you'd, you'd place a ball on the table, you'd pick up a pan, and you'd place the pan on top of the ball. That would take about 14 or 15 times for the chimpanzee to imitate it. But the imitation actually consisted of picking up the pan and picking up the ball and putting them together. So in other words, the, the animal was able to see sort of survival useful relationships between objects and between objects and agents, but was not able to step back and see the abstract movements that achieve that particular goal. So the ability to recognize a few simple goals and achieve them is one form of imitation. The idea of seeing a fairly complex behavior and paying attention to the different movements. Um, 
I sort of refer to, to this difference as the IKEA effect. And that is that if you're like me, what you do is you, you get this box of pieces and you get these instructions and you look at them very quickly and say, oh, I know how to do that. You thrust these pieces together and then the thing looks awful. And then you have to go back and say, oh, maybe I should pay attention to the details of these instructions. And so it's that sort of difference between, yeah, if you know how to achieve the goals and you recognize the goals, then you don't really have to pay attention to what anybody's doing. But as you, but it seems a transition of very great importance for humans to be able to break down behavior into pieces and recognize those pieces, even when you don't know what the pieces are doing. And this then makes the, the breakthrough of the language possible, the breakthrough of culture possible. So you can learn things, even when you don't really understand what all the pieces are doing. Because that mastery of the components will then allow you to make sense of how the goals are achieved that you might not have done otherwise. So, so this complicated slide um, is complicated because it's about six chapters from the book. Um, and, and, and so I'm not going to read the whole book to you. But the idea is that the transition along the hominid line is firstly from simple imitation to this idea that you can recognize another's performance, use that recognition to repeat the performance, but even more important, you've got what I was called complex action recognition, that you in some cases recognize that performance is sort of like a sequence of familiar things, but you have the great capacity to tweak those things to come up with a rather economical approach. So you don't have to go by trial and error, because if I go back to our IKEA example, okay, I put the leg in, but I twist it. Okay, that modification of the original action gets me the correct action I can build. And then the notion is that once I have a brain that can make sense of these performances, I'm close to a brain that can support pantomime. And once I've got a brain that can support pantomime, I suddenly have a communication system with an open-ended semantic. I can pantomime just about anything. I don't have to have that fixed repertoire that the chimpanzees were stuck with in their five and ten gestures. The catch, of course, is that pantomimes are expensive to perform and they're ambiguous. So the idea this sets the evolutionary stage for a proto sign of again, a group coming to agree upon conventionalizations of pantomime with restricted means. And then you're on your way. And then my claim is, read chapter nine, that's where the voice comes back in. Finally, it's got something to evolve towards to be able to take over combination of arbitrary gestures to convey messages. It can now begin to develop much more subtle control of vocal apparatus than any other primate. And then my claim is, once we've got this far, complex imitation, proto-sign, proto-speech, you're 200,000 years ago, you finished the biological evolution, and the rest is history, which finally, perhaps 100,000 years later, yields language, and then four or 5,000 years ago yields writing, and half a century ago yields computation. Okay, so I wanted to make one more point about the brain, and this will be a cunning segue into the last 10 minutes of my talk. Um, um, but, uh, so I just want to emphasize again that the brain has evolved to uh, the spinal cord by Yanosh and Hegatai. And just to give you a sense of how very distinctive they are, to suggest that those of us coming from neuroscience have this enduring challenge. How does this diversity of form relate to function? Um, to what extent does it make certain classes of virtual machines more possible than other classes of virtual machines? Now, my son is an architect. And when he saw the picture of the spinal cord, he retrieved this picture of the IBM tower. See a link to cognition and computation for you. The IBM town of Kuala Lumpur, the work of Ken Yan. And you must admit that that's pretty cute, right? So it's a visual pun. But in fact, in recent years, I have become serious about neuromorphic architecture. The idea is that we can approach smart architecture by thinking about the buildings as inside out robots. The idea that we could worry about building brains for buildings. And so let me tell you that there is an, there is an organization called the Academy.
Academy of Neuroscience for Architecture. And they have a website. And in September of this year, we will have our first annual meeting on neuroscience and architecture. So those of you who are thinking about robotics in this broader sense of what I call the inside-out robot, um, and want to look at how do we get from neuroscience-based insights in robotics to new ideas for architecture, or if you have architect friends who would like to learn more about the brain and, and think about this, there are really two different challenges. There's what I'm interested in, which is this neuromorphic architecture, giving brains to buildings. Uh, I think many of my colleagues on the board of the Academy of Neuroscience for Architecture are more concerned with how can we use neuroscience to get deeper understanding into the way people react to the built environment? And how could we monitor people's brains as they explore different real and virtual uh, environments? So in the last um, two minutes, is it? Um, let me just remind you of an interesting project, rather than uh, which goes back to the work of Rodney Douglas and Paul Vashaw back in Zurich uh, a decade ago, and they built this uh, intelligent space, this interactive space for the Swiss National Exhibition in 2002 in Lausanne, um, with um, it was called Ada in honor of Ada Lovelace, and the. Uh, the aid of the intelligence space was designed not to have a static functionality, but to really encourage interaction with people passing through the space. And so it had a brain based in part on artificial neural networks. Uh, some sort of emotion processing was part of the design of that brain. And it had this very interesting ability to interact not only with cameras and microphones, but also through this floor. And, and so the, uh, we see at the left the design of the tiles, so you could come up with different colors, but there were also touch sensors. So the system could detect where people were, and then with a simple uh, nearest neighbor type neural network, figure out where people were moving. And on that basis, it could come up with patterns of light that would attract people into different areas and interacting in, in different ways. And so there was this progression. You could just have a, a tile for one visitor. You, you could get together and, and come up with all these different uh, colored floor tiles. And then finding interesting visitors, you could try to group them together, both by rays of light and by patterns in the tiles. And then actually playing games with them. And then that's the most important point, since they had over half a million visitors, was to eventually use the tiles to usher them. Uh, the visitors to the exit so that the next people could come through. And uh, as I say, it was uh, an example of emotions in a neuromorphic architecture where I'm using architecture in the built environment sense that Ada in some sense was given a simple emotional system where interacting with people made her happy. <laughs> um, and so there, there were these different factors in her happiness, survival as measured by the flow of visitors, a recognition, how well could you get data about people, interaction, and her goal was to maximize pitch. And, and this requires some interesting tuning, because of course one idea is to just emphasize survival. Cool, you just want this big sign, this way to the exit. You have people streaming through, and the measure of uh, throughput is met, but not the others. So, so in fact, I think this was a case where rather than having the building work it out for itself, the engineers worked out what was the right balance between throughput and a good experience for, for the visitors. But, so there were analogs, all very simple, but different things that were measured that could be labeled as joy, sadness, anger, and surprise. And there's even a system working with a, a Brazilian composer, Jonatas Manzoli, which could compose sort of mood music using the robot composer, Robosa. To, to work through. So, uh, we come to the end uh, to consider both uh, the original questions and my versions. So, do animals need cognition? I said humans, yes, frogs, no, and try to give a sense of how different niches demand different brains. So, do robots need cognition? And I say, yes, some, well, not all robots, and so will buildings to be put into your extended a version of inside out robot, but many will not. And in particular, as we think about, I want the robot to do this. I don't want it to have that much autonomy. Maybe a tiny bit. 
touch, a smidgen of cognition will be enough for that work. Now what about does cognitive science need animals? I've tried to suggest by giving you an evolutionary story, which in some sense started with thinking about frogs and rats, but really took off with comparing monkeys, chimpanzees, and humans, to say that it's just as important to look at animals that survived without cognition as to look at animals do, to try and understand how the circuitry is related and what had to be added to give cognition. And that notion of cultural as well as biological evolution, where is the power, not because of a change in the circuitry, but because of the embodied experience of the young animal or young human within a, a culture or a particular way of life. So does cognitive science need robots? Um, I, I think it does, um, not perhaps most of what you're doing, but to the extent that you're reflecting on your work in terms of developing a cognitive architecture, then try to understand where does it help us to emulate the human in building the cognitive architecture that we're applying versus where does it uh, get in the way and we really need to think of cognition in new inhuman or non-human or post-human ways to, to get robots that really do our job. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the thing. And the very important idea which relates to something we heard today 
of instantiation and de instantiation. So it's not that you have a fixed control system, uh, rather, as time changes, you bring up certain schemas, you get rid of others. Um, that, that's one component where we felt that we could get insight from the animal that would have mapped directly into the control. In that particular case, we want to rate the manipulation more than anything else. Um, more generally, I want to add to it though, this notion of competition and cooperation that in a novel situation we bring many uh, robots into play. I'm very sorry I wasn't here for Rick Cooper's talk um, because he has a, a, a very good schema theory developed with Tim Chalice that sort of starts from the top, as it were, saying let's look at human psychology, let's look at brain lesions, and let's look at how we can deploy schemas to explain some aspect of a human psychological test that respects the, the effects of brain damage. So I, I want to, in some sense, come from the bottom up from these basic brain stem mechanisms from the top down. So I have a feeling I'm going to change it. Now, um, as I tried to say right at the beginning, as I start from the psychology, I may be looking at something without knowing whether it can relate to a particular part of the brain or not. Or I can start from the retina and say it's coming up with a basic visual input, but I don't know where objects are recognized. So I may have to say, well, I'm going to postulate object recognition as a schema. I have no idea yet how to get neurophysiological data to constrain. So for me, it's sort of a loop of a, I, 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 my neural net knowledge constrains some of my schemas. My attempt to understand complex cognitive behaviors constrains other schemas. When I'm doing language, for example, I have, a, as it were, a schema-based neuroscience-informed approach to language, but there's no way I can say, well, here are the neurons that do a word. So that's, that's sort of the basic point. It's, it's a, I say I've got two methodologies. I'm trying to make them talk to each other. Um, now, the other question was mirror neurons and simulation theory. Uh, yeah, I, I take that with a grain of salt. I don't think that, uh, I think there are situations where the idea of putting yourself in the other's shoes helps you understand them. Appealing to your own motoric representation can give you a deeper insight into what's going on. But in other cases, I, I think you just do recognition without mirror neurons to trigger reaction. If somebody is coming at me with a knife, I don't think, well, let me simulate their anger. Gosh, it must be terrible to be that angry. I'm really sorry for this guy. You, <laughs> you immediately invoke your, 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 your flight reaction or your fight reaction, depending on how well you're trained. So I, I, I really think that it's a bit like what I showed before. You've got this sort of high level, more cognitive schemas. You've got this basic mirror system that in some cases they cooperate. <coughs> In other cases, you really go with that gut feeling, that, that simulation of the motoric level. In other cases, you're using much more symbolic information. I, I think that idea is the brain has many, many different systems, and they invoke different coalitions depending upon the current task. I'm just saying that it's perspective of you know, from various elementary sense of order decisions and all the way to language. The one thing that is, uh, seems to be absent from this structure from supply side is development. Uh, you know, the you know, constraints from evolution for how language might emerge, but this uh, stop effect that we all learn in language, and that it's a real constraint of how we how system structure so to enable that. Is that does that uh, impact on on the it's, 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 uh, the, the standard complaint is that I was told I couldn't give the three-hour lecture. And um, so there, there was a book in 1986 called From Schema Theory to Language. And a portion of that book is the language development by my student, James Hill. Again, as part of our work on the hand, uh, we asked, OK, if you're saying the mirror system is learning because you carry out an action in your repertoire, but how did the action get into the repertoire? So we have a development in model called the infant learning to grasp. Model. So at any time, you take a snapshot of what's in place, whether it's an evolutionary snapshot or, or a cultural snapshot or a developmental snapshot. So today, I didn't talk about the, the developmental component, but thank you for mentioning it. It certainly is very much part of the consideration. Does it, does it provide constraints? Is it just added another story? Or? 
or are there constraints in how, how language comes about in your understanding? We say this is what should be learned. I mean, it's, if you consider the number of neurons in a frog's brain, why doesn't the frog understand Shakespeare? I, I don't think we're at a stage yet in a computational neuroscience of really understanding capacity for, for, for important things. But, uh, so, so, I mean, this is a really a driving question. The mirror system for the monkey can't support imitation. What is added to that system? Is it just better mirror neurons? No, I think it's a larger computational environment that allows the, the chimpanzee to support simple imitation. We add even more to complex imitation. So there's a, there is a, one of our research things is just trying to say, how do I take a model that does a certain class of things and try to understand what has to be added to that to get a new capability. That, that, that's what I get upset about some of the connectionist models where you take a, a little a cartoon of a behavior and then you add three neurons and now that clock can yield that behavior. And to, to, to get a handle on why is it that a certain class of behaviors will not work within this architecture? How much we build a new architecture by some evolution and then? So then development says you, you confront that system with a certain experience. You can confront the monkey brain with all the gestures you like. You won't even get to the chimpanzee level. The chimpanzee can do very well and do some amazing working memory things he can learn quite a lot of imitative things, but he can't get like He can get to the stage where he can teach him 100 symbols, he never gets syntax. So what did we have to add to that circuit? So, so yes, the give and take between what did evolution <laughs> give us to allow a circuit to learn, and then how did learning exploit that? And then as I said, you've got the snapshot, which is not just the underlying biology, but the state of culture. Today, a kid can learn to use a computer at the age of two. I have friends who are, have become insolvent because their child can phone them on the iPhone even when they're halfway around the world, invoking the next period of charges. But, you know, 50 years ago, to use a computer, you had to understand binary code. Um, it was a master's degree program to even touch it. So, so this process of how does the culture somehow learn capabilities so that a process of development can earlier and earlier exploit those capabilities, all the circle of ideas. But, but for me, as I said, the specific targets, a model of language acquisition of a two-year-old child, a model of learning to grasp within a general framework of comparative neurobiology, trying to get a handle on why can this circuit learn this but not that? What has to be added so it can learn that? But this can learn this but not that. Okay, two more questions, one over there, and then we'll jump on the last one. Please go ahead. Thank you very much for, for your talk. And, uh, can you move the mic, please? Oh, thank you very much for your talk, and also for claiming that frogs do not need con co cognition. Sorry. Um, I was uh, wondering whether you might define cognition as a uh, theoretical topic, since I might have uh, another interpretation of it. And also, I would be pleased to know uh, how uh, would you explain the acquisition of sign language, the, the, the reported acquisition of sign language in apes, or the uh, morphosyntactic uh, perception of uh, human speech in, in animals? Who do not have a cortex somehow? Okay, I'm not, I'm, come on. I mean, everybody else hasn't defined cognition. It's not fair to ask me. But I, <laughs> I am prepared to say that I will fight anyone whose definition of cognition includes frogs as having cognition. I mean, otherwise, it just makes this whole method of cognitive systems empty, right? Or you can have a continuum, something like Charles <laughs> says, thermostats of cognition. Well, if cognition is just, you know, if you change a little bit when the environment changes, you're welcome to have a cognitive frog. But, but forget it. All right, so that's the first thing. Now, the second thing, ape language. Apes do not learn sign language. It's very important. They learn a few signs. So it's a bit like, you know, forgive me.
hear my accent. If I said to you, Guten Tag, do I speak German? No, I've learned a little, a little motor pattern that allows me to be polite to you before noon. Perhaps. I don't know when I stop saying Guten Tag. But I mean, you get the idea, right? So the point, that there is no evidence of any ape, other than a human ape, having syntax. They can get a certain facility in using their hand to convey you know, some tens of signs. But, but that's it. Now, sign language, yeah. I mean, this is a primary motivation of uh, the mirror system of theory because uh, it really goes back to, to Ursula Bellucci of the Salk Institute with her team, her, her then husband Ed Klima and her colleague Howard Poisoner. They put out a book called What the Hand Tells the, the Brain. And the point was they were looking at aphasia in sign language. And so you have this sort of thing that, that there are two studies I know of. One of a, uh, an American sign language person and the other a British sign language person. And that <laughs> damage to Broca's area, which is a sort of speech production, but in fact they have got aphasia. So it's really a language area irrespective of modality. And these people then lost the ability to come up with the right signs, but they could still pantomime. So that the, 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 you couldn't say, okay, this is the sign for fly, couldn't get that, but could to, to get it across that. So, so this idea of getting to language through pantomime uh, allows one to be very confident about why the language brain is quite happy either way. If you take a deaf kid, raise them with signing people, they have to learn language on pretty much the same timetable as a hearing kid surrounded by speech. So it's, it's very much part of the theory to be agnostic as to whether you end up with, with speech or sign. But uh, one still has to come back and say, well, if sign is so good, why did you bother to get speech? And uh, that's another story. But for me, speech is secondary <coughs> to sign. And it's not going to get all the way up to sign language and then add uh, spoken language, but rather you only get up to some proto sign and then the proto sign and the proto speech can evolve together and expand in spiral. Final question? Thank you. Um, I Sorry, this is a very special question. And you mentioned emotions a few times, and what's been the answer to the previous question? The man attacking the knife and the useless principle simulating emotions, at least in this case. Um, what do you think about the question you asked, um, put into emotions? So if you want to study emotions, do you mean animals? And, and, and what is the biological reason for having emotions? What are they good for? Well, uh, I mean, the classic studies are that you, you do have you can correlate the hypothalamus with drives, hunger, thirst, fear, sex, and so on. Um, Joe Ledoux, for example, has made a living by looking at conditioning of fear in rats. <coughs> what, what is the circuitry that allows you to re recognize rather instinctive, rather than instinctive recognition of a scary situation to learn to experience what is scary and what isn't. Um, and then to look at, it, this implicates the amygdala, and then in the human you can trace what are the parts that link the, the orbital, orbital frontal cortex and other parts of the cortex, medial frontal cortex, to the amygdala. So the notion is, again, that you can, I mean, Joe would say explicitly, you don't worry about if animals have feelings, but you can say they have emotions, by linking them to a behavioral repertoire. And then the notion is, with that in place, you can build what is it about the interaction of the cortex that puts feelings on top of it. But the notion is you can't <coughs> understand our emotions if you don't know about the hypothalamus, if you don't know about the amygdala. And so we can study in the animal as it were the basic palette of primordial emotions. And then, of course, my pronunciation again is no good, was it Schaden for it? Okay, so Schadenfreude is my favorite human emotion, where <laughs> you, you're really into a complicated cortical situation to be able to represent 
the pain of others and, and get your pleasure from it. But the underpinning is still the fact that you can understand that they are in trouble. So this is where I think you would link the mirror system to the rather basic system to your study of animals. But now, not the same part of the mirror system. So for example, the insular is part of the brain that seems to be tied into disgust. So there are different parts of the brain linked to different primordial emotions, and then presumably are sophisticated <coughs> such as Charlie Fleur, get us into this cocktail that can only be mixed because of these advanced coordinate mechanisms. Okay, I'd like to conclude the session. Many thanks again for the presentation.